الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى عليه وصحبه وسلم أما بعد هبت في الله continue on in our study of بلوغ مرام uh, the book of marriage كتاب النكاح we reach the 842nd hadith narrated al Hassan from Samra radiyallahu ta'ala anhuma. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, if two guardians have given a woman in marriage, she marries the man she was first married to, reported by Ahmed and al-Arba. A tirmidhi graded it as Hassan. In this hadith, it means that if two guardians marry a woman to two different men, the first marriage is lawful and the second one is unlawful. If the two marriages take place at the same time, then both are unlawful and there is no difference of opinion in it. This hadith or this mas'ala is difficult at times for us to have an accurate picture because if we are seeking the consent of the woman then this should be prevented this should be prevented if two suitors come to 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 the to the woman and if the guardians are asking the woman then when it is uh, and seeking her consent then when it is brought brought and presented to the woman from the first suitor, when the second one comes to another guardian, although he may ha accept the suitor, but still he needs the consent of the woman. This is her haq. However, some of the benefits from this hadith is that it shows the importance of the guardians that if they accept or if someone approaches them to for example marry uh, their daughter or whoever they have a guardianship over that they should present this knowledge to the other guardians of the woman that is uh, whose hand of whose hand is being sought in marriage so that's one of the benefits we gain from this hadith. Another benefit of this hadith is that if one person uh, makes the act, then those, uh, uh, then any other suitors and any other uh, guardians who are responsible for the woman should be given notice and that of course the first suitor takes precedence but again this also comes with the consent of the woman so this as long as the woman's consent is sought then this should uh, you know this mess or this issue should not really arise the third benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us the inclusiveness of Islam and that Islam deals with uh, all kind of Messiah and issues and it shows the how in depth the shura is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not leave out anything regarding the affairs of human beings in the next hadith narrated Jabir radiallahu ta'ala an Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said any slave who marries without the permission of his masters or owners is like a fornicator reported by Ahmed Abu Dawood and Nisa'i and the Tirmidhi the layer graded it as Sahih authentic as did Ibn Hibban in this hadith, some of the benefits of this hadith uh, the main benefit of this hadith is this hadith illustrates for us 
is that in order, so this shows us uh, uh, the, the conditions for a sound marriage for the slave is that it must take place with the permission of the owner of the slave. So this shows us, this hadith here illustrates the condition, uh, one of the, merit, the conditions for a marital contract for the slave if someone is in that situation. In the next hadith, narrated Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'an, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, a man must not join together in marriage to him a woman in her and her paternal aunt, or a woman and her maternal aunt, mutafakun alayhi, or agreed upon. In this hadith, the hadith of uh, Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'an, uh, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that a man must not join together in marriage a woman and her paternal aunt or a woman and her maternal aunt. Uh, in this hadith, this hadith illustrates for us the tahreen of a woman being married for example, a man marrying a woman and her one of her aunts, regardless of which side it is from, that this is impermissible in Islam. And this illustrates for us that Islam is uh, looks to the importance of preserving the family ties and also Islam prevents the discord and we uh, studied this and looked at this in some of the Messiah and some of the early earlier issues and some of the other hadith that we studied in this chapter and that Islam cuts off the uh, the potential for discord with regards and dispute with regards to these merit uh, these issues and especially with regards to the issue of marriage. So in this situation, you can see some of the mufasid, some of the harm that could result if, for example, it were permissible, or if someone practices these practices. Perhaps this was a practice from the time of Jahiliyyah that a man could marry whoever he wanted to. The, uh, because if uh, a man were allowed to do this, because we know polygamy is permissible, but if a man were allowed to marry uh, a girl and her aunts, with this being the close relations like this, that you could see the fam familiar discord that could result from this, and uh, from being so close, uh, and if there was some discord with the the girl, and then how this would affect the elders or the affect her mother's sister or her 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 father's sister how this how this would affect the family and cause discord likewise this could cause jealousy and animosity between uh, a woman and her her uh, her uh, her elders in essence so Islam cuts that off and maintains the Islamic Brotherhood and likewise maintains those family ties. That is just one of the main benefits from the main, from the benefits of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. In the next hadith, the 845th hadith, narrated Uthman bin Affan. Affan radiallahu ta'ala anna Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said One who is in ihram may not marry or be given in marriage reported by Muslim In another narration by him it says he should not ask someone's hand in marriage 
Ibn Hibban added, nor give someone an engagement to be married. And in the next hadith, narrated Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam married Maymuna radiallahu ta'ala when he was in the state of Ihram during the pilgrimage, mutafakun alayhi, agreed upon. Muslim reported from Maymuna radiallahu ta'ala herself, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam married her when he was not in the state of Ihram. In this, uh, these ahadith, in the first hadith, the hadith of Uthman radiallahu ta'ala or the ahadith of Uthman radiallahu ta'ala where Allah's Messenger وسلم, said, one who is in uh, Ihram may not marry or be given in marriage, reported by Muslim. In this hadith, or in these ahadith, what we understand is the ruling regarding uh, the marriage of a muhrim. Or the, and also the ruling regarding the marriage of a muhrama and also the ruling regarding getting engaged even and the Prophet Sallallahu said La yankihu muhram and this when he said this Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he said do not uh, 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 or that the, the muhram does not get married or, or uh, does not get married meaning that they and this includes both the men and the women so although this is a general and this is talking uh, the muhram is the male who is in ihram who is on the hajj or who is um, you know making umrah that this includes both male and female and lets us know that it is not permissible to uh, get married. Also, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَتِمُّ الْحَجَّ وَالْعُمْرَةَ لِلَّهِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فِي كِتَابِ الْكَرِيمِ And complete the hajj and the umrah Lillah for Allah. So this lets us know that it is absolute it's absolutely necessary and an obligation as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded to fulfill the Hajj and the Umrah. And that by getting married one has violated that Hajj or that Umrah. They have violated the Hajj and Umrah and the second way that there's a type of facade or um, a type of sinfulness and a dis is that it distracts by marriage it also it'll distract and take away from that pilgrimage. Meaning the person who does this who, for example, if someone were to get married during the Hajj, then they will busy themselves the whole time thinking about, they just got married, they will be thinking about that. Even if they didn't consummate, they will be thinking about their new, uh, their new spouse. That will busy them and take away from completing their Hajj or their Umrah. It will distract them from it. They may complete it, but they will still be distracted. So it can... Uh, take away some of the reward of that ibadah or make them weak in that ibadah or perhaps maybe they won't even fulfill it. So it is from two different angles it can uh, affect you know and distract from that ibadah and number two it's an open violation of that ibadah because the Prophet ﷺ said لا ينكحو المحرم He said that the muhram does not get uh, you know, it's not permissible for the muhrim to get married. And the scholars also mention with regards to this hadith that this also, that the, the nikah that takes place, it is not actually, it's not a valid nikah. 
Okay, the scholars differ over this, but uh, many of the scholars uh, say that this nikah is not even valid. It is not a, a valid uh, marital contract. So then it is the marital contract is not valid and it would cause fasad for the Hajj or the Umrah. It would be a violation of the Hajj and the Umrah. So uh, this is prophetic warning to stay away from that which that which is normally halal. Some of the benefits of this hadith is first and foremost, this hadith shows us that it is the tahrim nikal muhrim, that it is uh, haram for the muhrim to to uh, get married. And this is because the Prophet said, la yankih, do not marry. So this here was a, 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 a very direct nahi, a very direct prohibition from the Prophet وسلم, and as we said countless times, a nahi yaqtadi a tahrim or a nahi yufi the tahrim that when there's a prohibition it shows that that is a uh, haram it shows that that action is haram meaning when there is a com there is a prohibition uh, that Allah has prohibited something with a command if you want in the imperative form that he's he's not commanded you but he has prohibited you from something you know, or the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has uh, prohibited you from something, then that means the asal of that is that it is haram. And so this hadith illustrates for us that that is haram. And that this nikah is ghayr sahih, is not uh, correct. And the ulama, they have a lot of tafsil with that or a lot of details with that, but we will... Uh, move on to the main benefits of this hadith without getting into this mas'ala in depth. Another benefit of this hadith is that this hadith illustrates for us in general that it is not permissible for someone to busy themselves with those things which would distract them from their ibadah, when they're doing ibadah. Okay, that a person should avoid those things which distract them from their worship. You know, anything that takes you, distracts you from your worship, then you should uh, avoid that. And so it shows us, so we gain that from this hadith, because as we see the illa or the reason, one of the reasons behind that ban of nikah, uh, during the as a, when a person is in a state of ihram is that it will take them away from that great act of ibadah that great act of worship and that hajj and umrah is lillah it's for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so this is also an illustration that from this hadith is also uh, an illustration of the qaida or the, the ruling the fiqh ruling uh, or to cut off the uh, the path to those things which are sinful or those things which are harmful. And in this case, nikah, which is normally something that is blessed and good, and that's why this is in the book of nikah, but this is showing some of the nikah muharrama. As we talked about before, this is now some of the forms of nikah, as we mentioned, the shigar, and other than that, which are impermissible forms of nikah. Likewise, to try to make an act or a marital contract during Hajj and Umrah is also from the impermissible, impermissible uh, contracts, uh, marital contracts, and it is not took place. So the Sharia, and from this Hadith, we see that it is closing the door to that which will distract you from your great act of ibadah which is the Hajj or the Umrah and also to uh, not just the distraction but the second point and we already mentioned this prior is that it also uh, closes the door to ruining that Hajj Yufsid to actually negate or make uh, uh, make that Hajj or that Umrah uh, invalid 
who would want to travel across the world spending their money, their wealth, and their time, and their efforts to make Hajj, and then it's you and you said al Hajj. Wa'iyadin billah min dalika. So that shows us the seriousness of it to avoid and adhere to the to avoid the prohibitions of the Sharia and adhere to the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that's another benefit of this hadith. Another benefit also derived from this hadith by the scholars is that this hadith shows us that it is muharram to make the khitbah, khitbah, uh, that the, to even make the marital, uh, to try to get engaged is also impermissible. So it's not just the, the marital contract of people who actually get married, but also the one who even uh, makes, attempts to get engaged, that this is also muharram. Regardless of whether it's the the man or from the point of the woman, and the prophet, and this is due to the statement of the prophet He said, "La yaktub, wa la yuktab alay." So the prophet sallallahu said, "And do not, uh, you know, get engaged, or uh, you know, receive a proposal to be engaged." Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith uh, illustrates for us also uh, as we mentioned it is in a uh, it points out that qaida that important ruling that uh, the qaida uh, fiqhia the 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 fiqh principle which is sadda dhariya sadda dhara'i uh, meaning to cut off the uh, the means to something which is harmful or cut off the means to something which is sinful and there are many examples of that in the sharia and this is just one of them as we see the prophet has uh, mentioned so the one who ha is not getting engaged this is cutting off the means to ruining your hajj or ruining your umrah likewise as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us to lower our gaze, this is cutting off, lowering the gaze is cutting off the means to committing the sin of zina. That with our eyes, this is a type of zina as the Prophet sallallahu described it. So that lets us know that this is cutting off the means. Because if you're not even going to look at someone, then the chances are very uh, unlikely that you're going to touch them or that you're going to commit zina with them so this is sadadriya this is cutting this off if a person is unwilling to shake hands with the opposite sex which the Prophet also mentioned that this is uh, impermissible and that it's better to be hit in the head with an iron uh, bar as the Prophet said then this is also cutting off the path to what? Cutting off the path to zina. Not that you're going to get najasa from touching their hand or anything like this. No. But rather, this is cutting off, this is sad dhara'i or sad dhariya. This is cutting off the bab, cutting off the means to committing uh, adultery, to committing fornication, to committing the, the muharramat. So the sharia has many examples of this. Uh, regarding the uh, the other hadith, the hadith of Maymuna, radiallahu uh, which is the hadith of uh, the hadith of Ibn Abbas and the hadith of Maymuna, narrated to Ibn Abbas, radiallahu ta'ala, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi married Maymuna, radiallahu ta'ala, when he was in the state of Ihram during the pilgrimage, and this is mutafakun alayhi. This is in Bukhari and Muslim. Uh, Muslim reported from Maymuna herself, radiallahu ta'ala, anha. The Prophet ﷺ married her when he was not in the state of Ihram. And, of course, Maymuna would know better of the situation of her marriage. So, this hadith has more precedence. And so, while in the state of Ihram, taking part in engagement to marry or marriage of one's 
own self or of someone else is not permitted, as we already mentioned, according to most scholars. So this is according to majority of the scholars. As regards the next hadith, which is reported by Ibn Abbas, his chain of narrators is also sound. But he was mistaken that the Prophet ﷺ married Maymuna while he was in a state of ihram. Maymuna herself has contradicted this in the hadith coming after it. So this shows us, uh, you know, the hadith of Maymuna uh, takes precedence because she herself would know better their state. And the scholars mention uh, more in detail about this hadith, but those are the most important uh, matters with regards to this, uh, to the hadith of uh, Ibn Abbas and the hadith of Maymuna. In the 847th hadith narrated Uqba ibn Amr radiallahu ta'ala Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said the most worthy conditions to be fulfilled are those by which you make sexual intercourse lawful for yourselves in marriage mutafakun alayhi agreed upon this is in Bukhari and Muslim. In this hadith of Uqba, uh, Uqba ibn Amr radiallahu ta'ala, there are immense benefits. And this is the hadith where the Prophet sallallahu said, the most worthy of conditions to be fulfilled. And this refers to uh, the conditions of nikah, the conditions for marriage, for the marital contract. And we're going to discuss uh, two types of conditions that you find with uh, related to most of the transactions uh, in Islam that require shuru. Uh, and f so, for example, uh, when we talk about shurut, shurut nikah, there are shurut nikah, meaning the conditions of the marital contract, and then in Arabic they say shurut fi nikah. Shurut fi nikah. So this is the shurut, the conditions within the marriage. And we're going to talk about that very shortly, about what the difference is between uh, those two. So in this hadith, the uh, hadith of Uqba ibn Amr, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, clarified for us that the most worthy conditions to be fulfilled are those which allow for uh, uh, sexual intercourse to be lawful between uh, the husband and wife. Letting us know the importance of the marital contract and the marital bond and fulfilling the conditions of the marital contract. So, in regards to this, some of the uh, benefits with regards to this is first uh, that we have to understand when we talk about these shurut, these conditions, uh, there are two ways in which we use this term. So we're going to have to go with some of the Arabic terminology and we'll, we'll do our best to translate it and make it clear. Uh, shurut shart as-siha wa ala shart al So, when we're talking about these conditions, a shart as means a condition which allows for this marital contract to be lawful, to, to, to actually take place. That means if it's not in place, then it is not a sound, uh, a legitimate marital contract, and the marriage did not take place. Shart al luzum this refers to uh, the conditions uh, within the marriage. Okay? And this is what we say, shurut nikah, for example. The conditions which perhaps the one of the either the husband or the wife have made particular conditions with 
to, to take place within the marriage. And we're going to give you lots of examples uh, to make this clear. But we just want to let uh, to to have an understanding that this is in per, uh, relevant to this hadith, and likewise in other types of transactions. Uh, for example, there is the shart of akt and a shrut fil akt. Just like uh, so, there is the condition. Uh, to make a contract sound and the condition uh, within the contract. So this applies to marriage and also just the general contract. Uh, likewise, the scholars mention, for example, uh, uh, a shart in, uh, for, for buying, for example, in Bayer, as we, we discussed prior to this. And then there are shurut or a shart fil Bayer. It, so this takes place within the uh, business contract and this has to do with something that one of the partners in the business transaction have made as a condition. And uh, so we, we're going to talk a, a bit, bit more about that before we get into the benefits of this hadith as there are many. So. As we said, the shart nikah, the condition for nikah, this would be like kabul wa ijab, to accept and uh, to 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 ask. For example, you basically, uh, you know, I give you my daughter in marriage, and then he has kabul. He accepts that. He says, "Nam, yes, I, I." would like to marry her, you know, as the Imam is asking this. So this is the uh, Ijab wa Qabul. This is like the, to, uh, you know, to offer and to accept this marriage. So that is a condition of Nikah. This pertains to the actual uh, marital contract that makes it a, a legitimate Islamic contract. This is in accordance with the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. When we talk about shurut fin nikah in the in the marital contract, there are basically three types, and these three tar types are as follows. There is the uh, a condition which is in agreement with the intention of the Sharia of what the Sharia intended. Okay, there's a condition. So we say this uh, a, a, a shart muwafaka or shurut muwafaka li maqsood aqt nikah. So this goes into the, meaning these conditions that come from one, either the husband or the wife are in agreement with the Sharia. And for example, an example of this would be uh, if, if a woman says, I want to stipulate in my marriage, so, you know, this is aside from the marital bond, but this is something, it's in agreement with the Sharia. The Sharia always, already gives her this hawk. But she says, I want you to uh, take care of me and be kind towards me. I want you to, and, and treat me good. And if you have more than one wife, I want you to be fair. And I want you to uh, clothe me and I want you to provide a house for me, you know, to provide for me a place to live. The Sharia has always, already given her this right, but she has stipulated that maybe she's seen people oppressed or whatever, so she is stipulating that. This is a condition, shart finnika, this is a condition she has made in the marital contract, which is already in accordance with the Sharia. Okay? And likewise, the husband could make uh, a condition, which falls under this one as well, to say that I have a condition that you will uh, have relations with me when I ask you. Okay, this is something we already know from the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu that this is from the Sharia. This is already muwafaqa, already has agreement in full accord with the Sharia, what the Sharia has already given his rights. So that is shurut muwafaqa. Those are conditions which are in agreement. So we're giving you a bit more, but hope, but this will be beneficial, especially as you study your fiqh, your fiqh durus, this will give you hopefully more insight and more uh, knowledge, bi'idnillah ta'ala.
without making it too complex. The other type of condition in the marriage, meaning condition in the marriage is from who? It's from the husband or the wife. They stipulated this, not with the actual marital contract that the Sharia has made as sound conditions for one to get married. So this, another type of shurut finika is uh, shurut or conditions which negate the, negate or go against the maqsad of the sharia or the maqsad of the uh, marital uh, contract. So these are conditions which, for example, if the husband or the wife, for example, uh, an example to make this clear, say if the wife, she says, she says, I'm not going, uh, you know, I'm stipulating as a part of this marital contract that you, uh, that I, if I'm not in the mood, you will not uh, try to have relations with me. Or I don't want to have, uh, you know, relations with you. That goes against the, uh, the condition and part of the, uh, you know, unless there's maybe some special, special case of she is sick or something like this, but we're talking about in a normal uh, marital bond. Or, for example, probably a much clearer example, which negates the maqsid of the shara, is if she says, I'm, uh, I'm stipulating at, in, in this marriage that I will not be obedient to you. I will not listen to you and I will not be obedient to you in any way. Then this goes against the maqsa because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already given that status that the men are the maintainers and supporters of the women and that the women uh, should be obedient to their husbands. They should listen to their husband. They have to more than consider their husband's feelings. They have to take care of their husbands. This is the Islamic um, uh, Islamic law and maqsad of the, in, in the shara that the woman must be obedient to her husband. And so uh, another example might be if the husband says, uh, and so this is also something that negates the, and goes against the act, the marital contract, is if he says, well, I don't want to uh, take care of you. He says, you know, in the marriage, I'm not going to take care of you. We're not talking about something where she, because that's her right. She can say, I work and I don't need for you to, to take care of me, so I don't want anything from you. That's her right. But for the man to initiate that and say, you know, we're going to get married, but I'm not going to take care of you. This uh, is a violation of the marital contract. So these are uh, conditions which go against the sharia, the, the akhtanika. So these are battle. These are false. The third type of shart or condition in the marital contract is one in which uh, a condition which does not go against the Sharia and the Sharia has not commanded. And for example, of this type of Shart Finika, condition in the marital contract, again, condition in the marital contract comes from the husband or the wife, this would be the case, for example, if a woman says, which is common in some uh, places, the woman says, uh, if you choose to marry another wife, she says this before they marry, she puts this as a stipulation in the marital contract, because that's normally halal for the man. She says, I want you to divorce me if you marry another woman. She makes that as a condition. So although perhaps the scholars may differ, but this as some of the scholars stipulate, uh, mention that this falls under that, where it, you know that she can stipulate. She can't stipulate that you divorce the other wife, but she can stipulate that she wants out because she feels she cannot handle that situation. So she says, if you choose to marry another wife, then I want out. So the Sharia has not commanded her to do that, nor does it necessarily prohibit her from doing that as she is stipulating that in the beginning. Another perhaps more clear example or less controversial example would be uh, 
if a woman stipulates in her marriage, she says, you know, I'm from Jordan, and I know you're gonna, you're, you have a job in Saudi Arabia or whatever the case may be. I don't want to go to Saudi Arabia. I want to be in my country and close to my family. If she stipulates that, this is a shart fin nikah. This is a condition in within the marital contract from her. And it doesn't necessarily negate the Sharia, and the Sharia has not commanded to do such an, an action. So this, you could say, is something that's mubah, permissible for her to do, as long as she has stipulated that beforehand, and the man has agreed to that. Then he cannot take her out of her country. So these are, this is the third type of shart finika. So I hope that distinguishes a bit, gives us a little bit of insight of the difference between conditions in the marital contract and conditions of the marital contract. Uh, some of the fawaid or benefits of this hadith. First, this hadith shows us the permissibility of conditions uh, in the marital contract. This hadith illustrates for us that uh, the uh, that it is permissible to have conditions shart shurut fin nikah that are conditions, not just the marital conditions, the, the conditions of the marital contract itself, that is well known, that's from the shara. But to make it a legitimate uh, marital contract, but conditions from the husband or the wife so in this uh, situation and this is due because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam this is due to the statement of the Prophet Wasallam, where he said he where he mentioned that there are conditions uh, and he mentioned this without restricting it he did not restrict those conditions at all and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in two different hadith in one hadith he said كُلُّ شَرْتٍ لَيْسَ فِي كِتَابِ اللَّهِ فَهُوَ بَاطِلْ وَإِنْ كَانَ مِئَةَ شَرْتٍ The Prophet ﷺ said, Every condition which is not in the book of Allah, then it is uh, false, meaning that it goes against the, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if it was a hundred conditions. That does not negate having conditions, because we know that those other conditions are not contained in the Qur'an, but the, they don't negate the Qur'an. They don't go against the Qur'an. So this is very important for us to understand because this, a lot of the Sharia, this, um, this issue occurs. That There are things that we see in contemporary times and people say, oh, you're ruling by other than what Allah revealed. You're this and this and this. But in fact, they are things with the, the Sharia didn't speak about, and they don't the the ruling again uh, of what of other than what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala revealed is doing those things which negate negate what Allah revealed. Okay, they negate Allah, what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala revealed. So, or go against it, contradict it. Also, proof for this uh, the conditions in nikah that which is derived from this hadith, the benefit of this hadith. Is also from another hadith. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, "Al Muslimun ala shurutihim illa sharatin ahalla haramin o harama halalin." The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, "Muslims are upon their conditions. Or Muslims, they, uh, you know, must uh, be in accordance with their with their conditions. With the conditions, you know, they must fulfill their trust and their conditions that they stipulate on one another." Accept a condition which makes that which is unlawful lawful or that which is lawful unlawful. So that shows us those ahadith along with the hadith that we're studying show us that it is permissible to make conditions within the uh, marital contract. Also this hadith we gain from this hadith it to show the broadness of the Sharia, of the Islamic uh, Sharia, and that it did not restrict people's conditions, their ability, like just saying the Atanikar, this, anything else is false. No, but rather the Sharia is broader than that. So it shows the that 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 it isn't so restricting upon people, and this is what we have to realize, and we gain this benefit from this Hadith.
another condition uh, that we, another um, issue or benefit we gain from this hadith is this hadith affirms for us that there are conditions in the nikah, as we mentioned. Conditions in the nikah. And that they are very important and fully must be uh, given their right. You know, if there's a condition that you've agreed upon, you must fulfill it. And it shows us also that one of the most important conditions that a person can fulfill is the fulfillment of the marital contract because whether that be the conditions of the mar uh, marital contract or the conditions in the marital contract because as the Prophet ﷺ said that this is the most right to be fulfilled because it is what uh, makes the private parts lawful meaning that uh, you know people have you know from this marital bond they can have and the fulfilling of these conditions makes it permissible for people to have sexual relations and this is the only bond which is recognized in Islam is through marriage the only uh, of sexual relations likewise this this hadith is uh, is a refutation or negates those people who make it really restricted as far as the marital contract and the, the conditions uh, in in the marriage. Those people who try to restrict it, this is a refutation of them. This hadith and those other ahadith that we mentioned. Another benefit of this hadith is that it shows that whoever is uh, not fulfilling the conditions that they have made uh, as far as the marital contract then they must do so and likewise they must give the rights to the person who uh, is uh, whose rights are being violated or being delayed so it's very important it shows us the importance of the marital contract and the, con the conditions of the marital contract and the conditions uh, in the marriage itself.